Hi, I'm Yeston Davis. I'm a counter tenor. And I'm looking forward to coming with Fretwork, the Vile Consort, to Early Music Vancouver on the 26th of November in Christchurch Cathedral. Okay, well, a counter tenor is um, a man who sings mainly in their falsetto range. So um, most people have a falsetto range. Most men, all men have a falsetto range. Um, I suspect many don't use it as much as counter tenors do, but that's essentially what I do. It's um, 24 seven, 365 falsetto. And if you were to look at a choir, you've got the sopranos at the top, the bass at the bottom, in the middle, you've got tenors, which is the highest male speaking voice and then above that you have the altos they can be women but they can also be counter tenors um boredom i i started singing counter tenor out of boredom i was when my voice broke uh i let it slip down from treble i um, mean it, it ended up in a sort of bass range but i was at um just at school at the time so i was about 15 16 and we had a chamber choir at school that was pretty good. Um, and I wasn't having any singing lessons. I was just seeing where my voice landed. And one day I was a, a, being a bit sort of um, idle in a choir rehearsal. And I just started singing along with the, the alto line, second line down. And it felt quite nice singing falsetto. Um, and the person next to me, thank God, said, that sounds okay. You should take it more seriously which was a really nice thing to have done because it um, is going to sound ridiculous, but it made me feel a bit special, which is always quite nice when somebody says, oh, that's okay. Um, and no one had to that date said anything about my bass voice sounding anything cl close to special. So um, I was perhaps looking for a reason to sing counter tenor because it felt good. Um, so having somebody say, take it seriously meant I, got in the car on the way home and said to my parents, look, I think, I think there's some singing still to be done because I sang as a boy um, to a reasonably high level in a professional choir. So when your voice breaks, you lose that instrument. And it's really, um, it's quite, I say traumatic is the wrong word, but it's, you don't realize at the time it's taken, something's taken away from you. And any child who's good at something, whether it be sport or acting, usually, of stuff gets taken away from you when you have an injury if you have a sports injury you may be a, a great rugby player or soccer player and something happens you have to stop whereas as a singer it's just nature you know puberty happens your voice deepens and it's no longer the thing it used to be so I had all this musicianship that had been kind of picked up through osmosis with singing in a choir and it didn't really go anywhere I played piano um I played the oboe I um, played the recorder, <laughs> so I had that one in. And um, so singing was the most expressive um, tool for me, but I didn't have an instrument. So that's really where the counter tenor came in. I was able to connect with that expressivity that, I, that, I'd, um, that I'd learnt. And again, it felt, it felt a little bit different from singing bass. Um, so almost immediately I went and sang to... Um, a conductor who conducted the cathedral choir in Wells in Somerset where I was at school and he um he himself actually sang counter so he sort of sympathized with me um and he said to me why don't you come into the cathedral choir once a week they did seven seven days a week he said just come in on Tuesday night um and just join join the ranks there were four counter centers there and I stood next to um actually I stood next to a Canadian counter tenor anyway there we go um but he um he let me sing the services and just start to feel what it was like singing counter tenor and i realized quite quickly that without a technique and just trying to sing like i did when i was a boy didn't get me very far other than complete exhaustion so i had a range of about you know a fifth or a sixth before i was like this is too hard and um like everybody else at that age when you decide you're going to go and do singing properly you go and get a teacher and that's what i did and after that, the rest is history. There was a kind of resonance to it. I think all young counter 
they listen to other counselors and, and you kind of imitate. And the, the cliche sound of a countertenor is quite unpleasant, sort of reedy, nasally kind of sound. But it's a it's a good start to get the resonance going in the facial mask. And because falsetto sits, it psychologically sort of sits above everything, kind of on the top of everything, but in a, it feels so different. Um, until you really learn to manage the voice and, and the sort of technique of singing and, and breathing and support, you are reliant on that that buzz you get to to to, to at start at the start to try and produce um, sound and produce and sort of project the voice. And you quickly learn that you can overcompensate on that and become just reliant on up here and actually doesn't carry very far or sound very nice. So my bass voice, uh, as my one of my choir masters at St John's in Cambridge used to say about some of the some of the some of the sort of teenage singing you heard it sounded quite agricultural um <laughs> like you've been let loose in a barn along with the animals by the manger and um i guess the what felt quite nice for me about falsetto was that it was a bit more mellow um and it didn't feel like my treble voice so i didn't have that oh i'm doing that again at all i can't really describe it but i was given a cd by um, a teacher at school uh, who said, oh, you've got to listen to this countertenor. He's just released this disc of Bach cantatas. Um, and it was a guy called Andreas Scholl. Um, and those of you who have not heard him, please go and find him on YouTube and Spotify and whatever. Um, really wonderful uh, musician, a beautiful voice. Um, and it's sort of somewhere in the middle between choral singing and op operatic singing. Um, Andreas is German. He grew up singing in a boys' choir in Kiedrich. And he, so I kind of related to his sound and his background because of where he'd come from. Um, he has the kind of voice, I guess, that many reviewers who like to describe countertenors as sounding ethereal, otherworldly. If you listen to someone like Andreas, that's kind of what they mean. So that was my first introduction to. A countertenor voice where I was like, oh, okay, this is something that I can connect to. I'd heard Alfred Della, but it, it's it's a very, uh, for me, it wasn't something where I connected, but I want to do that. It's a it, completely unique sound, Alfred Della's. Um, and um, I'd met James Bowman, famous British countertenor. Uh, the two of them, really, the kind of godfathers of the countertenor, Alfred Della, um, singing right up to, or close to when he died in 1976, but he was sort of big in the 50s and 60s. Um, but he was the kind of uh, the first countertenor to step onto a concert stage, really, and be taken seriously. Well, I say seriously. He tried to be taken seriously. Even James Bowman said to me throughout his career, he was performing at the highest level, was the most famous countertenor in the world. He said every time I got on stage, it was a battle to, to justify being there. So thanks to those two guys and then others after, um, we are able to do what we do today um, with a relatively straight-faced audience. <laughs> so I want to put it another way. But Andreas, and then also David Daniels at the same time, who an uh, American countertenor with a much more mezzo quality, mezzo-soprano quality to his voice. Um, his his background, his family, the singing teachers, he, he used to imitate um, the great opera singers of the day at parties, but sang tenor. And somebody said, a bit like me, they said, that's quite, that's something you should do seriously. So he did that. And David and Andreas were kind of rivals, but also friends. And they were, they both had big record contracts in the in the mid to late nineties. And it was a really flourishing time for the Counter Center. And kind of off the back of them, we've seen the next 20 years be what they are. So I had that luck of starting my Counter Center career, as it were, learning to sing imitating those sounds and saying oh that's great repertoire and I it just I turned a corner and I was like I was able to see this whole world I didn't know existed um because once you hear one piece by that singer you want to hear another piece sung by that singer and then you start to say oh okay so he sings not only religious music like Bach but he also sings this this music uh, called Orfeo New Edice by Gluck which is a very famous story but there's a whole opera and then there's other music by Gluck and then Handel and it sounds all very obvious but at the time for a teenager who was I was in a pop band at school and I was going to go and be uh, a pop star. We, we, we were nearly signed to Sony. And so I was on the verge of something else. So this was kind of completely unknown to me. I'd sung so much in choirs, but that is slightly different repertoire. 
We never sang Handel when I was a boy, for instance. Um, so yeah, that's a, a long-winded answer to to how I sort of uh, well the difference between my bass and my countertenor voice, I guess. I'm going to agree with you, <laughs> of course, but I, I, I do think this music um, is, it's difficult, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Was this music written for people who had that sound that we recognise now? I don't know, because this is the programme of 17th century music, and we really don't know, we have no idea what people sounded like before 1900, and, or around then, the invention of the gramophone and recordings. So, I have to imagine really that the, when I sing this music, it is meant to sound like it does. The vials playing, they sound basically like vials and the sound world we create is pleasing to the ear and it seems to work. Um, I don't think it particularly matters whether we're completely and utterly recreating the sound because nobody will ever know, but it works for me and it works for us. And sometimes there's, there's some of this music which feels like it's been written from a perspective that comes more from I'd say the operatic and more the dramatic side and some of it comes from the the religious choral sacred side it's certainly a mix of repertoire that whilst it's um all, all the texts are religious the the whole <clears throat> the tapestry of Europe in this period um post-reformation is one of overlapping um you know, overlapping faiths and political entities. So these composers are working for um, emperors, they're working for dukes, they're working for churches. They've all got different irons in the fire, but they're, you know, and sometimes they will change the text to suit the, the, the situation, as it were. They may take a very Catholic piece and put a more Protestant text to it. Um, but I feel that what's nice about it is that it, it works for me because it feels like music where I think you have to be quite versatile. So I can bring to it some of the declamation and the drama of my experience in singing opera from maybe 60 years later to this repertoire, mid 18th century. Um, and then at the same time, bring to it the qualities that maybe Purcell would have expected at the end of the 17th century. Um, and, and so, there's also a, a, a melancholic quality to a lot of this music, especially the, the lament side of it. There's a lot of death and sadness and grief. Um, and so right at the beginning of the 17th century, I'm an exponent of singing a lot of lute songs by John Dowland, which is full of melancholy. And then right at the other end, we start to see, or well, into the 18th century, to start to see the, the kind of religious music of Bach and Handel and opera. Um, so these, this whole world is kind of in all of this music. So hopefully what I bring to it is, is, about, is about right, as it were. Um, the other thing that I have to say is that I absolutely love some of this music. And I think when you love music and you're singing it, it's the best of both worlds because you're, it's that perfect symbiosis of doing a job which you love and being paid to sing to people from a place inside you that is completely sincere. Um, and that's as close as I can come to, as a, as a solo singer, to what I, the world in which I began, which was singing in a chapel choir in Cambridge University as a boy, where our job was to sing the daily services, but we were not expected, and to a very, very high level, you know, we were a professional choir who toured the world and so on, but our bread and butter was singing those services. And we used to be reminded that without these services, without that daily music making, we wouldn't have any of the other stuff. So you had to be really in it. Um, it was a real um, commitment of, of the, the soul, as it were, because um, as an eight or nine year old boy, I mean, not many people did that kind of thing. And our choir master at the time used to say what we did, what he thought we did differently from other choirs. Say, for example, there was a choir down the road that no one's ever heard of called King's College, Cambridge. And um, they uh, they were very famous for this pure, perfect little carol sound they do. And St John's always famous for a bit more kind of open heart, I say open hearted, but more continental sound. And George Guest, our choir master at the time, would say, 
we always aim for ex uh, emotion expression over perfection because and he said perhaps at the expense of perfection because if you know if you aim for perfection firstly i'm not sure what it is but secondly by aiming for emotion in the music there's a degree of spontaneity and he said you bring something to the piece that the composer has been unable to write on the page which is a really when you think about it that's quite a a pretty good reason to do music um because we can get bogged down in looking at music and saying okay there's this many notes on the page there's the dynamics do it and it can sound like that and people can worry and worry and worry and make it as exactly what's there but there's no there's no actual soul in it then it's the it's the the space between the notes the space and the silence the acoustic of the place you're in um often we were singing to seven people on a tuesday evening in february but it's the best music making i've ever made so whenever i hear that music you have that nostalgic pull towards it and this program to me is is part of that it's it puts me back in that place where i'm like not to give anyone any ideas but I, you don't need to pay me to do this <laughs> it's kind of it's um it's just really um uh what's the word i don't know it's 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 not just nostalgic but it's it's sort of heart engaging to 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 sing um so i hope that comes across regardless of what my voice sounds like i think it's just it's it's a, the true expression of who i am whoever it is standing there singing it i'm sure we can you know if if, if this this interview goes up online somewhere we can drop a drop a link but i did a piece for the guardian newspaper about sad music it was like a playlist of sad songs um I think it's been a true of, of all music genre that 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 sad music is in some in some way kind of more popular than happy music. Because the simplest way to put it is that it, in in sort of other people's grief, in experiencing loss, um, for example, or or death or um melancholy at a at a distance from somebody, you aren't yourself experiencing it but you are empathizing with it and you so it says empathetic kind of dialogue going on and um i am um, i think also when you think about watching i don't know soap operas on tv or you just have to pick up your phone these days and look at reels that are suggested to you on instagram or tiktok every day now we are surrounded by 24-hour news and come from the middle east for example and how many times do we need to see things blowing up and stuff? Um, and there's, there's, there's a sort of um, voyeuristic quality to that, where I think people are always interested in just looking over the fence and seeing what death looks like, because it's going to happen to us all. So this music brings us very close to that, and we're able to re it's really connect on something which is almost taboo. And I think when it's a taboo subject such as death or loss, um, it's, it connects with, for example, the importance of ceremony. I think the ritual, like having a funeral, the modern, you know, the, the modern funeral is starting to die out, as it were, for want of a better word, better phrase. Um, people are starting to say, well, why do we need to go to the great expense of, of having this church service where no one believes anything? But I think it's really important to have a moment to, which is kind of organised and ritualistic for people to process stuff. And what we do when when we take religious music that is out of context into the concert hall, into the church concert, um, it doesn't really change the the uh, the effect and the meaning. Um, so while some of this music might have been performed in context of a service, I think it still speaks in the same way. So an, an audience who don't necessarily believe in God or a person who doesn't believe in God may still have a very spiritual experience listening to this. Um, but I think for the, talking about the sad. The sadness of music or the, the the quality of the text um it's i think it's it's very um for some reason humans are quite good at writing it i we, we seem to go there quite easily whereas i think actually I, I read somewhere that you know writing happy music is quite hard um pop songs that are happy are quite hard they can sound very cheap and cheesy very quickly and almost the ones that are successful that are happy have very interesting sort of dark harmonies to them, I, I think. Um, but um, we just have to look at the, some of our favourite pop songs and you can see how much people love 
wallowing in uh, in the sadness. I mean, I love the Smiths, and there's nothing happy about them. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's um, it's also weirdly music I'm attracted to singing. I do something really. Uh, I love singing. He was despised in the Messiah. I know everyone's waiting for it to finish because it's nine minutes long, but I'm like, we're doing the full thing and we're doing it slowly because I love that. Um, and I find actually happy arias sometimes harder to sing. I just find them, I don't know, it's just something, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. I think everyone has, a, has an understanding of what it is, but not necessarily um, put it into words, which is important because when you can't put something into words, that's what music and poetry, um, you know, expect poetry as in they are words but expressing expressing a meaning that you can't be very literal about music does that very well and I think there's one of the things in life which is hard to explain is sadness and death and loss and to process anything we have to somehow go to that place of melancholy and get through it to come out on the other side um, I think it was Robert Burton who wrote the the anatomy of melancholy said it only through melancholy can we cure melancholy they are both mother and daughter and they they tread in a ring and um that sort of um 17th 16th century um idea of um melancholic bile the the body being filled with black bile and good bile and that pre-medicine the idea that um there was some sort of cure to be found through this this idea of melancholy being something um that we expressed and had to go through. I think it, it translates now into modern psychotherapy and we talk about Freud and stuff and not necessarily giving somebody a drug to cure them because that cures them temporarily and makes them forget the pain. Um, but actually, you know, it, investigating what it is to talk about your problems, to, to, to go to those places and find out what it is that caused them and, you know, what, what we, the, the sort of dig into your shadow kind of thing. I think there's a lot of, I say pleasure, but there's there's a lot of um, um, satisfaction, maybe, um, or or it's or it sense you go you go somewhere you actually have a have a, um, a journey through through talking about stuff through delving into poetry delving into music, and um, I think it's transformative in that sense. So the sad music is more transformative than the happy music. Well, the, the, the vial is the sort of, the vial consort is a small group of vials which come in different sizes. As you'd imagine, um, in the harmony, there's going to be a low one, a middle, and they go right up to treble vial. And um, they look like they sound. So the treble vial is about the size of a violin, and the bass vial is like a cello, a big fat cello, really. And they, they, um, they come before the violin, the cello, the violin, and so on, come from that tradition. And actually, this music, is it an interesting time because most of it is written for these instruments. However, towards the end of the 17th century, with more violins and cellos and the instruments developing, the composers weren't so bothered about people using those instruments in conjunction with these instruments, and eventually it goes away entirely. And the viola da gamba kind of carries on as a sort of very special instrument. Bach uses a lot. Um, to represent certain things in his passions and it becomes a sort of soloistic instrument because it has a very special quality um, which uh, I don't want to explain too much about it because I'm not a vile player nor do I know, know enough about them but I can tell you one thing is that everything's sort of backwards on a vial with a violin when you when you bow that way and push this push the bow that way and draw it across the string it's the other way around the gambler so it's, it's much about pulling and if you pull the bow across the string, it sort of stops. You have to kind of connect it with the, the up bow, as it were. So the, the, the instrument is much like the human voice. It feels like drawing, drawing the bow across the string. It's a bit like how we breathe and sing. Um, in fact, there's a piece called um, Les Voix Humaines, a French piece by Marine Marais, who was a um, court gamba player um, in, in France. And that is exactly that expression of the instrument being like the variety of sounds that the human voice can produce. Um, and so there's something preferable to singing with the consort of vials with this repertoire because it feels like much more like a, an organic 
um, togetherness between an ensemble, which you might not get with a, a string quintet or string quartet. So I really like that about it. And in fact, they you really have to sort of breathe together to make this music work successfully. We also have a chamber organ to sort of knit the sound together and, and fill in some of the harmony um, in this in this music. Well, this, programs like this are are interesting because they don't have a conductor, um, and yet it would be very helpful when when you're rehearsing to have somebody external from the group to say, you know, this is what the balance sounds like, or you're getting behind, or you're out of tune. Um, and that's the classic thing about small groups is that they can be very political, and um, there's a certain uh, frisson in the air when you go into rehearsal rooms, and you can sort of tell what kind of day it's going to be. Fortunately, because I'm the addition to the group, as it were, um, and I get all the words and a lot of the tunes, I sometimes can take on that role of, of stepping back and listening to them if they want me to. And likewise, some of the pieces don't involve all of them, so some of them can step out. So it does feel very egalitarian. It feels like something where you have to agree together the how, how you're going to go forward. Um, I think it's... It's basically the, the basis of all chamber music to use your ears because there's only so much you can do looking at music, playing your instrument, singing, looking up, all that kind of stuff. It becomes like singing in a choir, it's sort of osmosis. You pick up, you really have your antennae out all the time. And I quite like that as a, as a, a form of music making. Um, because it trains me better to be a best musician in general. So when I go to sing with orchestras who have a conductor, the, the temptation is to say, I'm just going to pay attention to the conductor because he's in control. But really, that's not what he wants you to do or she wants you to do. The conductor wants you to be part of a big chamber piece, to be listening to the inner pulse of the music, to anticipate. Because actually, the conductor is not controlling everything at all. They're there to rehearse and then to inspire. But really, by the time you get to the concert, he's kind of should, they, they should be handing over the responsibility to you, the performer. And of course, there are those conductors who would never say that because <laughs> they like to justify their place and their fee. But it is ultimately the best music making is when everybody is, is listening and there's nothing worse than an orchestra is staring at their scores and just looking at the markings. And it's very difficult to do a, a concert at that level with a small group because we're all very aware of how much we rely on each other. It just takes one person. And the chain is as strong as its weakest link. And the moment that link is broken, you know, it's <laughs> point the finger time. But that never happens with this group because we're all good friends and we have a really nice time. And I think that's also part of it is that when you're not making music, you are able to um, live a life on tour that is um, kind and... Um, you know, full of nice cultural things, good food, um, agreeable travel. I know fretwork are, are particularly, um, uh, have particularly um, made an effort to be a bit more green um, in the last few years. They they try and, if you're renting a car or renting Teslas, uh, trying to avoid flying as best you can. It's pretty impossible when you're coming from Great Britain to Canada and then we go on to the States. But um, because they're a small group, there are ways around that to, to lower your carbon footprint, for example. Um, so it's um, it's all part of a kind of uh, uh, kind of team brand, as it were. So that and that that that's what helps in the rehearsal process that people don't take it personally when someone says, you know, this sounds a bit rubbish, or can you do this better, or are you slowing down? Um, and that's that's a nice environment to work in. Sure. I mean, depends on where I'm going and, and, and who I'm with. But one of the first things I'm sure all singers do this or people who like coffee, one of the first things you do before you get on the plane, it's like, right, well, I'm going to get there tonight and then tomorrow morning I need some coffee. So you look for the best espresso. Um, obviously, as a singer, you know, how you eat and stuff like that's important and when you eat. But I like good food and there's nothing worse than getting stuck in a hotel and thinking oh, I'm going to rely on the hotel menu sometimes it's nice and you feel a bit indulgent but um i'm i always try and sort of find somewhere nice to eat um 
And I guess it's it's kind of also allowing yourself, and this is a very boring way to answer this question, but it's allowing yourself to be okay to do nothing because the body takes time to travel. You know, you get there and your breast of your body comes about. We, I've just been to Australia and I went for a month and <clears throat> I um, there's a brilliant app, which I recommend for everybody. This is not an advert, just the only app available called Time Shifter. Um, and uh, you put in your flights and you put in the flights back and it gives you a timetable of how to get over jet lag. So for someone like Australia, it's brilliant. I had two days before I went, told, it tells me when to be in darkness, i.e. be asleep, when to get up, when to have daylight. Uh, so that's your circadian rhythm sorted. Um, when not to have caffeine and when to have caffeine and the same on the flight as well. So on the long flight to Australia, go to sleep now, put the eye mask on, don't touch coffee. And it works. However, um, th that's great for sleep. You go to sleep, but there's something strange. I don't know. Maybe it's evidence we have a soul. The soul doesn't quite catch up with you. So my my second concert, which was a week after I got there, was the first time I was like, oh, I can do dynamics. I, I know how to support the voice. I can produce a sound that isn't like this. Um, so it's it, it, it's kind of depends on how far you're flying and like that stuff. But I would say that being okay with saying, you know, you are actually doing a job because we have this very amazing life where we get to go to these wonderful places. And sometimes you think you feel like you should be on holiday because you've like, traveled to this amazing place, but actually it's your job. And um, so I, I have to sort of fight within myself not to take too much time off, or if I do, to do it wisely. So maybe stay in bed for like six hours when you wake up in the morning just because you're going to sing better. Um, and then you feel guilty because you're going to miss out on lots of lovely things. However, it's um, it's it's nice being with a group like Fret Work on Tour because there's just enough of them that they, they might want to do their own things or they might have an idea to do something together. But there's no pressure as you have when you're just with one accompanist so where they're like, we're going for dinner. And you kind of have to say yes. And I've got a, uh, many stories of working with a lieutenant, Tom Dunford, and we've been to Canada. Um, and Tom loves Michelin star restaurants. And he, it's fine for a lieutenant, he doesn't have to sing. We, we got to Bogota in Colombia. I mean, jet lag beyond at altitude. And I get to the hotel and he texts me, said, hey, I've booked a Michelin star restaurant tonight. They've got alligator on the menu. Do you want to come? I, like, I can't, I can't. <laughs> you know, so I never have, I've never had alligator. um very good question there are i mean all of this type of music this period of music and this type all my favorites on this program the books to huda jubilate domino which is just uh, so cool i've recorded that before it's one of the first things i've recorded i love that the jc bach lamento is arguably the best piece ever written for an alto to sing um then there's this wonderful wonderful clark lead which was written by books to huda in for his father's funeral and it's just the saddest piece ever but there's something just it's it's almost hypnotic because it's the same verse um same verse of music different text for eight verses i have to say we're not doing all eight verses because it's far too long and i i would my voice would die after singing it um it's very long so we're doing i think three or four verses but it's just hypnotic in the way it repeats and it's almost as if books you played it at his father's funeral can't just doesn't want to end the piece because he knows when it finishes, that's the body going off. Um, and then there's a Schutz um, which is again, just there's something about the theme that I sing at the beginning, the re repetition of a Barmdich. It's like somebody in a kind of um, very enraptured sense of prayer. And it, it's, yeah, it's just mesmeric hypnotic music. Um, and actually some of the music, which is less well known, in rehearsing it and doing it over and over again, you start to find things in it which are utterly beautiful just for a moment here and there. Um, so it's it's full of like little rough diamonds as well. Um, but I'd say, yeah, my, I think the Lamenta by JC Bach, which is kind of the title of the whole thing, is um, hard to beat. Oh, 